out into the soft tissues and into the connective tissues. The white cells can also wander back into the bloodstream, uh, also into lymph nodes, lymphoid organs. Lots of white cells are in there and they move. Once, sometimes they go in the lymph nodes, sometimes they come back out and get into the blood. The number of white cells actually in your blood is very small. Where there, as there were millions and millions and millions of red cells, there's only about 5,000 to 10,000 per microliter in our bloodstream. So a normal white counts about five or 6,000. That's another number you ought to need to know, and you need to know that that means number of cells per microliter of blood. Um, they move by amoeboid movement. They can move in and out. They're attracted to chemical stimuli. Usually if the area is acidic, then the white cells will move in. And then some of them are phagocytic. The neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the monocytes. That's three types of white cells that are phagocytic. In other words, they eat stuff. Here's the list of the types of white cells that you do need to know. Uh, neutrophils are sort of neutral. Eosinophils are very red. That means they take up the red dye uh, that we use to stain tissues with. They become very red. Basophils are basic. They're not acidic, so they, they become very blue. Monocytes are a little different. They just have one big nucleus that you'll see, and then lymphocytes are kind of smaller, and they also have one nucleus. Um, this is the only time in A&P that, in my opinion, you ever need to use oil immersion in order to see these cells as well as you see them in these diagrams right here. Now, the neutrophil here, um, you see has uh, kind of neutral covered, colored granules, and that's really what we're talking about is the color of the granules that are in the cell. We often call neutrophils, we call them multi-segmented neutrophils or segmented neutrophils. In other words, the nucleus segments into different parts. So this one here you see has one, two, three, four parts to its nucleus. They're all kind of connected usually. Um, but that's a segmented neutrophil. We also you'll you'll hear them referred to as segs quite frequently uh, on the, in the hospital ward. So that's a neutrophil. An eosinophil is bright red. Uh, there's not very many of these. This is by far the most common type of white cell, by the way, the neutrophil. The uh, eosinophils are usually one percent, if that much. You have a hard time finding those. We have a couple slides over in the lab that are entitled eosinophilia. And even in those, uh, even in that blood, uh, that person doesn't have more than maybe five or ten percent eosinophils. But you can find them, and they're they're pretty striking when you see them because they are bright red. Uh, eosinophils uh, attack parasites. So here in this country, we don't see too many folks with eosinophilia. In other words, lots of eosinophils because we don't have that many folks that get parasites. Neutrophils attack. Uh, bacteria. So they're the most common and we are all fighting bacteria all the time. So if you get a splinter in your thumb and of course that splinter's got bacteria on it and when that gets under your skin uh, it's gonna, the, you're gonna get inflammation in the area and you remember inflammation is colore and dolor and rubor and tumor are gonna swell and get red and hurt and, and, and get warm um, you're going to have neutrophils move into the scene to try to fight the bacteria that were on that splinter. And indeed, that's what they do. Um, indeed, if you get a splinter under your, in your finger and it breaks off under the skin, uh, lots of white cells are going to move into that area trying to fight it. And if they can't fight it, uh, it's going to have, have to work its way to the surface or you're going to have to lance it and drain that thing. Because pus, uh, what you think of as pus and what I think of as pus, is nothing more than zillions of neutrophils trying to go in there and kill those bacteria. The last one over here is basophils, um, dark, uh, dark, uh, darker than these two, very basic in color. Um, monocytes, um, illustrated here, they have one nucleus. It's always U-shaped like this. Um, and um, I'll just leave it at that. And the final type of white cell is the lymphocyte. Lymphocytes fight viruses mostly. Uh, 
um, but they can fight other things as well. But the lymphocytes, uh, the nucleus is about 95% of the cell, usually just a little bit of cytoplasm. That's the way to tell it. They're dark blue as well. This is an example of platelets. Platelets are very tiny. You see they're probably 1 50th the size of a red cell. And they're, they're, they're not round and they have no nucleus. Uh, they're just little pieces of cell fragments. Uh, we'll talk about them later. Um, but they help in your clotting of your blood. The lymphocytes, which I just showed you there uh, as this one right here, are very important to us. We have several classes of them that you should know about. The T-cells. They're called T-cells because they originally derived from your thymus gland. You remember your thymus gland is the one in your chest, um, below your thyroid gland, your thymus gland, and that gives you cell-mediated immunity and allows you to ta attack foreign cells and cancer cells directly. A T-cell count is something I'd never heard of until the early 80s when we heard of this new disease on the market called AIDS. And AIDS patients today, their biggest problem is having enough T-cells. And so indeed, when an, an AIDS patient goes in to see the doctor, the most important blood test they get is a T-cell count. And if their T-cell count is getting really low, they're in trouble. Um, and they're going to either get their medicines changed or something's going to be done differently because they've got to build those T-cells back up or some little infection is going to overwhelm them and take them away. B-cells um, are also important. They uh, give us blood-borne immunity. They make antibodies against viruses and things, things like the flu. And this is why you get your flu shot. Um, they give you some antibodies. Um, they, uh, they give you an antigen, actually, that makes you synthesize antibodies with your B cells to make you immune from that particular strain of the flu. And um, then the third kind is call, are called natural killer cells, NK cells. And these are the ones whose job is to uh, seek out and find abnormal cells that have mutated and are turning into cancer and we want to be able to destroy those as well. So, they, they all look the same, they all look like lymphocytes, but the T cells originally came from the uh, thymus, the B cells came from the bone marrow, B stands for bone marrow, uh, and the natural killer cells are just what they say they are, they're killers. Um, if you've got a series of seven or so uh, different kinds of white cells, we will often order a differential and a white count. So every time you order a CBC, which means complete blood count, you get a white cell count, which tells you how many white cells you have, and you'll get a differential. Now what that means is the white cell count, we said normally was about 6,000. And if you have an infection going on in your body somewhere, you might have a white cell count of 15,000. Well, that means your body is struggling to make enough white cells to fight this infection, and that tells you that, yep, you probably got an infection somewhere. Then you look, so that's the total white cell count, and then you look at the differential. In other words, is it mostly, is it mostly neutrophils? Is it mostly lymphocytes? Is it mostly eosinophils? What's causing that rise in the white count? And indeed, you know, if it's an infection from a bacteria, it's going to be your neutrophils that are going to be up there. Um, and uh, if it's uh, parasites, it might, it might be your eosinophils that are real high, um, and so forth. So that's what a differential is. And the, the lab tech does the differential by basically sitting there with a little finger counter, and he, he, he looks around on a blood smear, and every time he sees a lymphocyte, he punches the lymphocyte button. Every time he sees a neutrophil, he punches the neutrophil button, and so forth. And the whole idea there is then when he gets to 100, the little thing dings, and he looks down and he t tells him what percentage of each of the cells they had. A uh, quick review of the different cells, red blood cells. Uh, there they are. Uh, there's what they do. Uh, neutrophils, also called segmented neutrophils because the nucleus is usually in segments as illustrated there. Uh, 
Here's an eosinophil with a really a red um, uh, granules in it. Very rare. Uh, you'll only see 2 to 4%. So you may look all day before you find an eosinophil, to be honest with you. Basophils are the same thing. There are very, very few of them, less than 1%. Um, they uh, enter damaged tissues, release histamine and other chemicals that promote inflammation. So they're kind of a, a scout kind of cell. Monocytes are our big cell. Uh, usually have one kidney bean or U-shaped uh, nucleus. Uh, these guys are macrophages, uh, like I said, and they uh, live for months. Um, lymphocytes uh, are usually about 20 to 30 uh, percent. So the big two are your mononucleated red, uh, white cells, your SEGs, segmented neutrophils, um, and then your lymphocytes. Um, these the lymphocytes are the ones that are, are designed to fight certain exact pathogens. We'll talk about our immune system here in a few, uh, a couple of weeks. Platelets is the last one. Um, they're little tiny things. This almost looks like they have nu nucleus in them, but they most most of them don't. And so I think I'll just leave that at that. Um, they are there to help you clot your blood. They are very short-lived. Um, they live in your body maybe for seven days. Uh, they're continually made by megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are these great big cells that live in the bone marrow. They break off little pieces of their, their cytoplasm that then form platelets. Um, this is kind of a summary of where these cells all come from, and I don't want you to be able to draw this, but just so you know, the hemocytoblast is the name given to the basic stem cell for all blood cells. That blood cell can de de develop one of two ways. It either goes this way and forms these myeloid stem cells, which come from the bone marrow, uh, and, or the lymphoid, the, lymph the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are formed by forming lymphoblasts, then prolymphocytes, and then um, uh, l mature lymphocytes. All the rest of the cells in our bloodstream are formed in the myeloid system. These are in the bone marrow. And you, here they go. You can see some of them turn into, under the influence of EPO, erythropoietin. They form these progenitor cells. They form blast cells, they form erythroblasts, they throw out their nucleus and become reticulocytes and then eventually become red cells. Now remember, this is 99.99% of everything over here in this first column. The second column here is um, the progenitor cells develop into megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are these huge cells in the, in the um, bone marrow that break off little pieces called platelets. And then we have this another group here that develops into uh, myoblasts that turn into basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, and another set there goes in and forms monocytes uh, down here. So um, I think that's, that's as much as you need to know about that. I think the most important thing is that all of the blood cells basically start from a single stem cell called a hemocytoblast. Now, leukemia is a name for red cell or for blood cell cancer. So you can have lymphocytic leukemia, you can have monocytic leukemia, you can have eosinophilic leukemia, um, basophilic leukemia. Um, you can even have too many red cells formed. But that's what leukemia means, uh, cancer of the blood cells. Let's talk about platelets for just a minute. These are those little cell fragments <coughs> that are very important in our clotting. Uh, they circulate not for very long. They die very quickly. In fact, uh, when we used to, a uh, patient had a very low platelet count and they were still bleeding and we had to call and get platelets from the blood bank, they usually were only good for about five hours. So usually you had to have fresh donors walk in, donate their blood, take their platelets and give them immediately to the patient for them to do them any good because they just don't last very long at all. Most of our platelets in our body sit around 
uh, in our body. We just kind of save them up for emergencies when we need to stop uh, things from bleeding. Uh, platelet count is normally about 150 to 500,000. These are two terms you need to understand. One is called thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia means not enough of, right? So thrombocytes are the name of these little clotting cells. Thrombo, thrombus, cyto, cells, penia, abnormally low platelet count. That's dangerous. Uh, People that are thrombocytopenic generally tend to start uh, bleeding from their their jaws and their gums. And they'll oftentimes come in and say, Doc, every time I brush my teeth, they just bleed like crazy. Um, that's a pretty good sign that they may have a thrombocytopenia. Uh, and needs looking into further. Thrombocytosis is po folks who have too many uh, thrombocytes, too many platelets. Thrombocytes is another name for platelets. Um, that's a bad deal, too, because these people can clot abnormally, and forming clots in your bloodstream is not a good deal. Um, so that's thrombocytosis. Um, what do they do? Well, they, re they not only do they kind of grab on together and try to patch up these holes in the vessel walls, as illustrated there in number two, but they also import, they release little chemicals that then set the rest of the system of blood clotting into action. Uh, to get going. And the thing that you all remember the most about your thrombocytes is that it actually leads to contraction of the uh, tissue um, uh, after you form a clot. Now we have another name for that, it's called scabs. And a, a scab is formed by mostly blood cells and some thrombin and uh, platelets and that shrivels up and gets smaller and even though your mother tells you not to pick at your scabs you all do and uh, eventually uh, it falls off and, and you're healed. Um, platelet production is called thrombocyto. Gosh, why does it keep doing that? I hate that. Um, is uh, uh, making of thrombocytes it occurs in the bone marrow and it comes from these megakaryocytes that I've already mentioned uh, that manufacture the platelets. Um, talk for just a minute about bleeding and how do we stop bleeding. We call that hemostasis. Uh, we want to quit bleeding. Hemostatic. It has three phases. The vascular phase, the platelet phase, and the coagulation phase. Now just real briefly, the vascular phase consists of the fact that when you cut yourself, all the little blood vessels that are carrying blood to that, to that vessel that's bleeding all go into spasm and they contract down really hard. And indeed, you can cut pretty big arteries that will totally go into spasm and totally quit bleeding. Uh, that's the vascular phase. That's what happened first. happens first. Then the platelets come in, and they start grabbing together and trying to form a little clot. And then the third phase is when all the coagulation factors come together and, and, and with the fibrinogen that we talked about earlier, form a real clot. Um, the vascular phase will last about 30 minutes. Hopefully that's enough to get the patient to the operating, uh, to the operating table before they bleed to death. Um, but this first phase is very important. It lasts about 30, 30 minutes. And basically I think the only thing to know about this is that it's just um, the blood vessels going into extreme contraction to try to stop the blood flow. Then the platelet phase comes in. It starts very quickly. The platelets start sticking together and they start sticking to the inside of the blood vessels to try to stop this bleeding. Uh, they form a little platelet plug uh, which helps close the bleeding. And then finally, the coagulation factors come together and uh, uh, a, a real clot is formed out in here. Uh, and uh, uh, this is blood and... and platelets and he is all these chemicals come together to form real clotting uh, to real clot to form a real clot the clotting factors are very complex and I am not going to struggle stress you with trying to learn them but let me just make a few comments there are 13 different factors that have to be activated in the exact right order in order to form a good clot um, some of them you know about. Fibrinogen I told you about. That's the, the one that uh, forms uh, strings of clot. Um, 
and using and prothrombin is one of the pre-activators uh, to form thrombus, which is clot. Um, calcium ions are important in clotting. Uh, we've talked about calcium a lot, and we'll continue to talk about calcium a lot. And then go on down here. Here's factor number eight. Factor number eight is the anti-hemophilic -hemo factor. Um, Hemophilia is a disease that affected my life, I think I can say. I had a next-door neighbor who was one year older than me when I was in high school. Um, he was like two years behind me in school because he had missed so much school because he, he was a hemophiliac and he did not form clot properly. Now, this was back in the 70s. And in those days, when somebody who had hemophilia started bleeding, there was nothing they could really do but go to bed and see if it wouldn't stop. Um, and usually it was bleeding into their joints. He, he always bled into his knees and his hips. Usually just from walking, he would start bleeding. And he'd end up in the hospital, need a lot of platelets. He would need a lot of uh, anti-hemolytic factor. Um, and uh, they got that from blood transfusions and from plasma transfusions that people had donated. And uh, this factor eight, uh, which you see there, was the thing that would stop the bleeding and save this kid's life. But then he had to dissolve away that entire clot, and that often took weeks. So he was flat on his back for weeks as it all cleared up, and then he could get out and go again. But he could never play sports or even run. And finally... Um, I went on off to college. Um, he struggled on for a few more years and finally uh, blew his brains out because he really had no life and he wasn't going to have a life. Now, that was sad because 15 years later they developed a, a way to synthesize anti-hemolytic factor so it could be manufactured. And so that's what people get these days is a manufactured form of anti-hemolytic factor. The only way we could get it at that time was to pool plasma together. So you'd often, sometimes these uh, antihemophiliacs would get a thousand units of antihemolytic factor, which came from a thousand people. Well, then in the early 80s, along came this disease called AIDS. And if one person out of that thousand people that had donated blood in order to get that kid his antihemolytic factor, that kid got AIDS. So almost all of the hemophiliacs in America died. From AIDS shortly after the onset of that, before we could test even, we didn't we didn't even have an HIV test to diagnose it. So all of these uh, kids pretty much died. Now they don't have to get that; they can get just the simple drug, and that's not such a problem. Um, but it it always has bugged me, and I, I had several patients during my career that had hemophilia. And they, had, they just had the world's most miserable life. Um, his sister uh, was a carrier, had, had one of the genes, um, or had the gene, uh, but she was a, being a female, she didn't get it. Uh, but she would give it to all of her boy children, and so she didn't want to do that, so she had a tubal ligation. And after seeing what it had done to her brother, and they ended up adopting kids only. Um, Um, uh, hemophilia uh, is the disease that was called uh, was that was rampant in the uh, royal families of Europe, the Germans, the Austrians, and all those folks. There was lots of the boys, the, the kings, that were hemophiliac, and they all pretty much died of it. That's where the term blue blood came from, because they would bleed under the skin, and their skin would all turn blue, and uh, that's where that name came from. Wasn't a good thing to have. Anyway, um, just another kind of review slide. This is what uh, this is what the final stages of the fibrin forming and forming a real clot looks like. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, you need all kinds of ions and stuff to make the clotting system work. It's very important. And it takes a while after the clot has formed for it to retract. We could, if somebody wanted to bleed 15 or 20 cc's of blood, we could put it in a test tube and watch it clot and watch it retract over about an hour. But I don't think we'll do that. Um, while it's very important that we be able to form clot to stop bleeding, it's also very important that we be able to dissolve clot.
and that happens through a process called fibrinolysis, in other words, the dissolution of clot. And these days, we have a new drug that's been developed called TPA, Tissue Plasminogen Activator. And this is the drug that can be given to people that are having a heart attack. A heart attack is usually caused by blood clot forming in one of the coronary arteries that supplies blood to the heart tissue itself. That clot can be dissolved and those patients can be saved. Uh, that's really uh, been a major step forward in the management of heart disease, and I'll show you a video on that uh, later. Okay, let's call it. So that's the whole chapter, uh, that's the whole blood chapter, and when we meet again, we're going to start talking about the heart. I believe that's correct, and I'll go from there. I'm sorry about our little bomb scare today. I just got a message on my Apple Watch that says that school is going to be canceled for the rest of the day today. So, bummer. I guess I'll get to make a video like this for my 233 class as well. Um, hope you found this helpful. Over and out.